Okay, guys. Um, we'll finish up on the blood chapter today and hopefully get started on the heart. Uh, we're a little behind, but as long as you guys are picking everything up and understanding it, I'm okay with that. Um, so we left off talking about the blood and we talked about all of the other formed elements. Right? We talked about red blood cells. We just finished talking about white blood cells. Now we're going to finish up by talking about platelets. Um, what's the technical term for a platelet? They're all on both sides. Um, because they're going to have something to do with thrombin. Thrombin is a very important enzyme um, that has to do with the blood clotting. But that's where that name thrombocyte is coming from. Remember that platelets are not full cells, right? They're what we call cell fragments. They're literally like little envelopes that pinch off from a bigger cell. And they're really just like sacks of clotting factors. They don't do much else besides assist in the clotting um, process. So they're, they're not entire cells. When we look at the way that platelets are formed, um, they come kind of from like the same stem line. Remember, we've got my, the myeloid stem cells. And the myeloid stem cells are going to make these giant cells called megakaryocytes. And the megakaryocytes are what are going to pinch off in order to form the platelets. One megakaryocyte will pinch apart to form thousands of platelets, like 4,000 platelets. So that's a lot, right? A lot of platelets come from one megakaryocyte, and they're tiny. If you remember from your lab when we looked at them, the red blood cell's pretty small, and the platelets were like specks compared to them. They're like tiny little flecks that you see um, showing up on the blood smear. When we look at platelets again, they're pretty much sacks of clotting factors. Clotting factors we'll see are um, proteins that are gonna be really important in the clotting, um, the clotting process. So they're things that once activated and released kind of stimulate that blood clotting process to stop um, bleeding at a site of injury. Again, they don't have a nucleus, they don't have like organelles, they're just sacks of clotting factors. Um, they have a pretty short lifespan because of this. Again, there's no way to like repair themselves or anything. They don't really have any mechanisms um, to replace proteins or phospholipids or anything like that. Um, so they only circulate for about 9 to 12 days before they're removed by phagocytes. Um, phagocytes will engulf and remove them mostly in the spleen. Um, and it's really important that they don't just get old and wear out and burst because then they're going to start releasing all of those clotting factors. And we don't want clots to start showing up like crazy. Um, so it's important that these phagocytes are able to monitor the bloodstream and engulf uh, the old platelets before they actually release all of their components. When we look at platelets, only about two thirds are roaming around the body in general circulation at any given time. We withhold or kind of reserve about a third of your platelets for emergency situations. And again, that's normally in really bloody organs, um, specifically in the spleen, which is very, very vascular, very, very bloody organ. Um, and what happens is if there's some sort of a hemorrhage or, or bleeding emergency, we'll mobilize those platelets. And that blood that's in the spleen will be, um, like if the vessels all uh, constrict, and those platelets will be mobilized, they'll travel out to the site where they actually are needed in order to clot and kind of relieve that hemorrhage. The typical platelet counts between 150,000 and 500,000 cells, or I guess they're not really cells, right, but platelets, per microliter of blood. Below this, we call thrombocytopenia, right? What does penia mean? Poverty. So thrombocytopenia is a poverty of thrombocytes, right, or a low platelet count. Um, the major sign of a low platelet count is obviously going to be bleeding, right? If platelets are important for um, clotting, if you don't have enough, you won't be able to clot. So you'll see bleeding happen a lot with the patient. Um, bleeding can happen in the GI tract. So you'll see blood appear in the stool. Okay, there should not be blood in your stool, but if you see stool that's kind of streaked with blood, that's a sign that platelets might be low. Um, under the skin, what do you see if they're bleeding under the skin? A bruise, right? So if you see bruises, um, and in the mucous membranes. So this can show up a couple different ways. These can show up as nosebleeds. Hey, if you have somebody who doesn't typically get nosebleeds frequently, some kids are just really prone to them. But if you have somebody who doesn't normally get nosebleeds, then all of a sudden they start getting a lot of spontaneous nosebleeds, I would check on their platelets. 
Um, and then also the gums when they brush their teeth. Okay, in a healthy mouth, you should not be bleeding when you're brushing your teeth. Um, so if you have somebody who comes in who's bruising like crazy, whose gums are just gushing when they brush their teeth, I would be worried about their platelet count. Um, thrombocytosis is the opposite. Thrombocytosis is an abnormally high platelet count, right? Like we saw leukocytosis was high white cells. Uh, thrombocytosis is high thrombocytes or a high platelet count. This typically signals that there's just an infection or inflammation going on. Um, when there's an infection going on, we start to release all of those colony stimulating factors to increase our white blood cells. But remember, some of those colony stimulating factors like multi-CSF work really high in that production chain. So they'll end up increasing our platelets as well. Um, if it's super, super high, this might be a sign that there's some sort of a cancer going on. But typically we're just looking at like infection or inflammation. Platelets have a few distinct functions, but they're all kind of interrelated. Um, and all of the functions of platelets have to do with trying to stop you from losing blood after you injure a vessel. Okay, so it's all kind of related to stop bleeding. Um, platelets release important clotting chemicals or clotting factors. We'll see that they release something called platelet factor three or PF3, and that platelet factor three is really important in stimulating the clotting process. Um, they also temporarily plug damaged <laughs> vessel walls. Okay, so you have a blood vessel, if you puncture it and you're losing blood through that area where it was cut or punctured, platelets can form this, they get really sticky, they stick together and they form a little clump, and they can plug up, or kind of like a cork, they can cork up that break until you're able to patch it with a more long-term clot. Um, we call that a platelet plug. Okay, so they can form a platelet plug to kind of temporarily plug it up so that you stop losing blood through that broken area. Platelets also have the ability to actually contract. Okay, so they can contract or shrink to decrease the size of a break in a vessel. So like if you have platelets that are attached to this part of the broken vessel and this part of the broken vessel, and then they contract or shorten, they're gonna pull those two sides closer together. So now you have a smaller hole to lose blood through and a smaller hole that you have to repair. When we look at platelets, they actually contain filaments of actin and filaments of myosin. Where did we see actin and myosin? Muscles. Remember the actin and myosin interact with each other? and cause contraction or shortening. So we see that happen in platelets on a much smaller level. Um, and again, we're just trying to slow bleeding as much as we possibly can. We'll, kind of, we'll talk through the process a lot of detail. So before we get into the whole clotting process, we've got a few more kind of general things to mention. Platelet production is called thrombocytopoiesis, because again, platelets are thrombocytes. And just like all of the other blood cells, this occurs in the bone marrow, right? In the red bone marrow, which is where? Spongy bone in adults. Um, so with thrombocytopoiesis, again, this section here um, is the same as most of our other blood cells, right? Everything but lymphocytes have this same beginning part where we have the hemocytoblast, which gives us a myeloid stem cell. What's the other type of stem cell that it gives us? Lymphoid. lymphoid. What do lymphoid stem cells give us? Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. Myeloid stem cells give us what? Everything else. Everything else. <laughs> okay, so the myeloid stem cell is gonna give us this megakaryocyte, which we mentioned before. Mega, again, meaning really, really big. And this megakaryocyte, again, is just gonna start to shed packets of its cytoplasm. It just literally pinches off a packet, 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 and each of those packets have a bunch of clotting factors, things that kind of stimulate the clotting process when we have a bleed occur. Um, and again, each packet is a platelet. So thousands of them, like 4,000 per megakaryocyte. We have a couple different hormones that increase platelet production. We've already seen this one here. We just mentioned it too. Multi-CSF. Remember, CSF is colony stimulating factor. And we had a lot of those, right? We had monocyte CSF, 
or MCSF. We had granulocyte CSF. We had MG CSF. And we had multi. And multi CSF, remember, works up really high in the chain of division, right? Like if we had hemocytoblasts, myeloid, and then we had subdivisions, right? And we've got all these divisions that are occurring. Remember that the multi CSF is working really high up here. So if we stimulate this division, we're gonna stimulate all of these byproducts too. So multi-CSF stimulates what? The production of what? What comes from my white stem cells? Everything but lymphocytes. Good, perfect. Um, it stimulates platelets, red blood cells, and then all of the white blood cells except for lymphocytes. So multi-CSF is also going to promote the formation of thrombocytes. Okay, by stimulating how many megakaryocytes we have, eventually they pinch off and we end up with more platelets. Thrombocoetin, um, or TPO, is something else that increases the production of platelets. And this is more specific. Okay, so this is specifically platelets. This is the thrombocoetin or TPO is not gonna stimulate everything else as well. And again, the names match, right? Thrombocoetin stimulates thrombopoiesis or thrombocytopoiesis. Okay, so stimulates thrombocyte production. Again, this is just kind of FYI. Again, you see platelets. Platelet counts typically between 150 and 500,000, 150,000, 500,000. We see that they're involved in hemostasis, okay, or, or the clumping of blood to stop blood loss after an injury. They're relatively small cell fragments that contain clotting factors. So the last big chunk of this lecture is on hemostasis. Right? And hemostasis is just the cessation or stopping of bleeding after an injury to a vessel. Okay, so that could be the vessel tears, it gets punctured, you cut yourself and cut the vessels. Any damage to a vessel that messes up the integrity of the wall of the vessel and allows blood to start leaking out should stimulate hemostasis so that we can stop the loss of blood from the vessel. Hemostasis occurs in three different phases, and these are all kind of working together, um, but they overlap each other. It's not like you go vascular, then platelet, then coagulation. Um, they all overlap and, and work with each other, and again, the whole point is that we want to stop blood loss or limit blood loss as much as possible. So we'll start with the vascular phase. The vascular phase is called vascular because it starts in the vessel. Okay, the vascular phase is initiated or begins either in the vessel wall or in the damaged tissue around it. Okay, so it's starting outside of the blood. It's not actually starting in the blood with the platelets. When we look at the vascular phase, initially what happens is there's some sort of cut or puncture or damage to the vessel wall, and that triggers a vascular spasm. Okay, the spasm will normally last up to about a half an hour or so, um, and when we look at this vascular spasm, we have three different things occurring. Um, one, the endothelial cells contract. Remember, if we are, we haven't done vessels yet, but if we look at a blood vessel like this, we see a line of endothelial cells, right? These are little simple squamous cells that line the vessel. And then underneath them, they're connected to a thin basement membrane. So a layer of simple squamous cells attacked, uh, connected to a thin basement membrane. Um, the endothelial cells, when they contract, so like this cell gets a little bit smaller and the other cell gets a little bit smaller, so this one's down like that and that one's like that, that exposes this basement membrane underneath. Okay, it might seem in insignificant, but later it's going to be important. So the endothelial cells contract, exposing the basement membrane underneath. The endothelial cells also release numerous chemical factors that are gonna kind of stimulate the clotting process. They'll start to stimulate and activate platelets and all of the other things to get everything going and start this whole clotting process. Um, they release ADP, okay, adenosine diphosphate. Um, tissue factor, tissue factor is one of our very, very important clotting factors. Okay, so tissue factor, it's factor three. 
don't confuse that with PF3. PF3 is platelet factor three. It's a form of platelet factor. Okay, tissue factor is factor three. Um, and then prostacycline. And again, all of these things are gonna kind of start and stimulate the clotting process. They also release something called endothelins. And endothelins are local hormones meaning they're released into the blood and then they act locally. They act right in that little area that they're at. And what they do is they cause smooth muscle contraction. Okay, and that makes sense. If you think about, I have a vessel that's this big, okay, and vessels have smooth muscle around them. Okay, so like underneath this, you'll have this smooth muscle that circles it all along the line. So the end of the end, you cut this right here and you're losing a bunch of blood, right? The blood's just leaking out everywhere then the endothelins will be released from these cells right here, and they'll act on this smooth muscle right in the same area. And that causes the smooth muscle to contract. Okay, that constricts the vessel. Obviously, if the vessel was this big, and then we squeeze it, and the vessel's now only this big, you're gonna lose a lot less blood, right? You're gonna lose more blood through something this big than if you squeeze it and make it that big. So the endothelins cause a smooth muscle contraction, to decrease the size of the vessel and they stimulate cell division of these endothelial cells. Okay, we said that the vessel is lined with endothelial cells. If I break the lining, I'm gonna to have to replace it somehow. You replace it with new endothelial cells. So you stimulate cell division so that you can have new cells to patch up that broken area. Finally, the endothelial cells that are over here their plasma membranes get sticky. Okay, they're not normally sticky. The plasma membranes start to get sticky though. And what that allows to happen, if this break is small enough, is that the cells that are lining this area right here can start to stick together. And you might be able to close it off if it's small enough. Okay, so you have this big hole like this. You shrink it and make it smaller. And then all the cells lining it start to get sticky and start to kind of try and stick together like this. Then we're also causing cell division in all of these cells. So new cells are coming to pack in this area. Okay, again, the whole point is we're trying to repair that vessel. The vascular phase is everything that's happening in the vessel, trying to repair the integrity of that vessel. Okay, I said tissue factor is very important. That kind of makes sense, right? I said we're starting in the vessel or the tissue. So tissue factor goes along with the vascular phase out in the vessel. Um, endothelins are also highly important and the fact that they stimulate smooth muscle contraction to shrink the size of that vessel is very very important um, and here we just see that happening a little bit better than my drawing <laughs> although I'm quite the artist Guys, this whole clotting section seems ridiculous. Like there's so many words on every slide. There's a thousand steps and phases and like it's gonna seem like I don't know what to grasp onto. This is too much. So I, that's why I kind of bold things and I repeat the things that are important. And at the end, we'll kind of summarize all of that. There are key points that I want you to latch onto because they're important. Um, so don't get overwhelmed by the volume of it. I will not ask you to just sit there and like reproduce the entire thing because it's, it's not necessary. You don't need to be able to do that. So again, we're talking about bleeding, right? The blood vessels carry the blood. When we break a blood vessel, the blood now leaks out of the vessel. We need some way to stop that from happening so that we don't bleed out. We don't lose all of our volume. <clears throat> so when we start to have um, a break in a vessel, we start to hemorrhage, we've got three different phases that kind of stop that or, or, or clog up the blood so that the blood isn't all lost. The first one's the vascular phase. Again, the vascular phase is starting because of stuff out of the blood, out here in the blood vessel wall or out here in the damaged tissue, all out here. And really we're looking at things that happen in the vessel. First off, our endothelial cells that line the vessel will contract or shrink, and that's gonna expose the basement membrane that lies underneath them. Again, that's important later. It's a good attachment point for later. Um, also, the endothelial cells release endothelins. These endothelins act locally. Again, we've got muscle okay, that lines this vessel. 
in the endothelins tell this muscle to contract. When it contracts, it squeezes the vessel and makes it smaller. So that's what you see right here. That vessel opening is now much smaller and you're gonna lose a lot less blood through it. It also stimulates cell division. Again, we have a break, we have to fix it somehow. So we're gonna fix it by making new endothelial cells. Um, finally, the endothelial cells will start to become sticky. And again, that kind of helps to repair that open area, especially if it's very, very small, when you can start to get cells to stick to each other, you can kind of close up small breaks. Okay, all happening in the vessel, that's the vascular phase. Again, it normally takes about a half an hour total. So the platelet phase is super quick. Um, the platelet phase typically begins within seconds after an injury. It's a pretty fast one. And the platelet phase is obviously what's going to be happening in the blood, right, with platelets. So the vascular phase happens in the vessel. The platelet phase, we're concentrating on the platelets, what's actually happening in the blood. And the platelet phase includes platelet adhesion and then platelet aggregation. So adhesion literally means attachment. Okay, the platelets that are floating through the bloodstream are going to attach or adhere to the sticky endothelial cells, right? Remember we said that the endothelial cells at that broken area are gonna get sticky. Now the platelets will stick to them. They'll also adhere to that basement membrane. Remember we exposed to the basement membrane, those cells shrunk so that you could get to the basement membrane underneath. So now the um, platelets will adhere or kind of stick to that basement membrane. And then also exposed collagen fibers. Collagen's kind of like rebar. Like if you know anything about construction or concrete work, you don't just throw straight concrete down, right? You put those metal bars, you put rebar in it, and then pour concrete and that makes it strong. Collagen's like that in our body. Collagen forms this like substructure in our body to keep it strong. So there's collagen fibers kind of sticking out everywhere. And when you tear or break something, some of those collagen fibers will kind of stick out, right? Just like when you see a building knocked down, how there's, there's like those metal bars that stick out from it. Um, so kind of like that. So the platelets first attach, right? They adhere to the collagen, to the sticky endothelial cells, and to the basement membrane that's exposed. Once the platelets have attached, then they start to stick to each other, okay? To form this big mass of platelets. And that's called platelet aggregation. Okay, they aggregate, they clump. The reason for that is that these platelets are super, uh, they're activated. Once the platelets are activated, they get super, super sticky. And they like to clump anyways. Remember like in the blood smear when we looked at platelets, how you typically see groups of them together? Okay, so those groups of platelets that are already together, now once they're sticky, they'll naturally clump together pretty rapidly. And that's what forms this platelet plug that we were talking about. Again, the platelet plug is just like a cork. So if I have a blood vessel here, and I have a tear in it right there, all of this starts to get sticky during the vascular phase, right? The vascular phase makes these endothelial cells sticky. Then during the platelet phase, the platelets, will, platelets are floating around, they get activated, and then at first they attach to these sticky endothelial cells, and then they start to aggregate so they'll stick to each other, right? All the platelets that float by will start to stick to each other like this. And eventually you get a big enough mass of platelets that you might be able to temporarily plug up that break in the vessel so that the blood stops leaking out. Um, this is an example of a positive feedback loop. Remember most feedback loops in the body are negative, right? Because we want to remain homeostatic. Typically we start to change, the body cancels it out and brings us right back to normal. But this is, a, for a small period of time, an example where we actually go further and further and further from homeostasis. Is this, we speed up this process um, in order to form this platelet plug. The reason for that is that once the platelets get activated okay, by the chemicals released from the endothelial cells, once they initially get activated, they'll release more chemicals, like platelet factor three, which we'll mention in a second, that stimulate more platelets then those platelets release more chemicals that stimulate more platelets. Those platelets release more chemicals that stimulate more platelets. And you get this more and more and more and more and more process where all of the platelets in the area are getting activated and getting really sticky. Again, that's positive feedback, right? It's not normal to have your platelets be sticky. You would be throwing clots all over. You don't want that to happen. That's not homeostasis. 
Um, but it is protective in this little short period of time. So that time where you kind of activate more and then more and then more is positive feedback. We'll see that we have one other area where we've got positive feedback that occurs during clotting. All right, here we see that, again, the vascular phase occurs in the blood vessel, right? We've got endothelins making it contract. We expose the basement membranes. Um, our endothelial cells start to become sticky. That's the, um, the vascular phase. The platelet phase is what happens here actually in the blood with the platelets. Um, when we look at the platelet phase, again, we activate platelets and then the platelets go through an attachment and then like an aggregation. So adhesion is when they attach. They'll attach to the basement membrane that's been exposed. They'll attach to the actual endothelial cells. They'll attach to collagen and then they stick to each other. Okay, that's the aggregation. And again, the whole point here is that you end up with this platelet plug. You end up with this kind of cork or a mass of platelets that will clog up um, this, this tear in our vessel wall right here.